think I'm not going to be able to do that at all. But here we go. Previous to that, uh, I did do, I kind of spent the last three years doing security research specifically on medical devices. So I managed uh, large healthcare organization security programs uh, for just over five years. So I do have experience, not only, you know, recently I just moved to consulting, but I do have an industry experience uh, from uh, healthcare uh, groups. So. so my Twitter handle, if you want to uh, send me anything or send me any questions that you don't want to ask me. Uh, Feel free to do that. So first, kind of a little bit of background. You know, why did I want to get into you know, researching medical devices? What was it all about? Um, was it something? You know, did I have a passion for it? Yeah, I think that's really what it came down to. When I worked at the healthcare organization, it was really to me. It was always, you know, it was good to work at a healthcare organization and, and provide that you know support to kind of clinicians, physicians, and caregivers. But I never really felt like I could directly contribute to an organization's mission or values. And that always happens to relate to patient safety. So when I started coming across you know, medical devices and kind of you know, looking at uh, documentation and, and looking at security controls that uh, you know, are in the devices or in many cases aren't in the devices, that's when I really realized that you know, I should probably start taking a look at this. Uh, I've got a little bit of knowledge of it. I'm still not an expert. These, uh, most of these things I'm going to show you are, are very basic concepts and stuff that we solved in, you know, uh, it's not an asset talk necessarily, but the asset components of this and, and the weaknesses we find are, are stuff that we've solved 10 years ago in our industries. And, and there's numerous reasons for that um, that I'll explain. But that's kind of why I got into it. Um, the other was really, you know that I knew healthcare was five to ten years behind, and so I wanted to do something to kind of, you know, be able to equip, you know, the defenders, the other information security teams inside of healthcare, uh, in you know helping you know deliver you know, patient care and and, and, and protect, uh, you know, protect people. Does anyone work for healthcare or manufacturer side of healthcare or for a provider? Or? Um, no, service, well, service provider. They buy people from it. Okay, awesome. So secondly, um, there was did the, the first part of my research that was really focused on actual device specific issues. And so what we found, as I said, is, is a lot of these things were, were very simple. So it kind of rolled up into you know, three or four components to where it was you know, weak hard-coded credentials, unencrypted web services, uh, systems that you couldn't patch. Uh, it wasn't really anything advanced that we had looked at. But with that, I got a lot of uh, pushback, uh, even from physicians, uh, to that research. And they said, yes, you found some of these issues inside of devices, but there's no way, I put my PhD title on the line, that you can get these things from the internet. They're all internal, they're segmented. Well, I knew, I worked in healthcare, that that wasn't the case. Uh, things are changing in healthcare. And there's a need to push all that data back and forth between all of these devices into the medical record. So things like population management, real-time vital information is very important to get that. So in doing that, I knew you couldn't segment these. And I also knew that critical infrastructure in medical devices uh, is often recommended to be opened up through the firewall for remote support for uh, manufacturers. So it's kind of another reason I did it. Uh, this is an FBI pin. Basically, it came out in April. It came out in June and April. The FBI is kind of new to the game. Uh, the first releases started coming out on medical devices. Anyone know Billy Rios? 
familiar with that name? Okay. Uh, he's another researcher that, that has spent a lot of time and uh, released like 300 um, and reported 300 uh, to DHS and to the FDA, hard coded credentials and medical devices, just about a year and a half ago, June 2013. And so the uh, FBI got involved, um, and they're really looking at it now. Uh, they have an interest in it. They're also looking at it from the, the financial crime, so not just a patient safety issue, but also from a you know patient privacy and some uh, medical records type thing that happened with uh, the CHS. This is a disclosure process on some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, this was a while ago. Uh, so the first thing, uh, like I said, I, we initially did research on the actual devices. So everything from fusion pumps to CTs to MRI systems uh, into external defibrillators, kind of across the gamut, across all different you know, modalities and devices inside the healthcare environment. And then we went further to prove that you could access these systems and these healthcare organizations directly from the internet. So this is a disclosure process, just so you know. So the bad news, you know, it, what I show you here is really uh, a misconfiguration inside thousands of healthcare organizations that are exposing medical devices to direct attack vectors. And then I'm actually going to talk about a use case at the end where the devices themselves are directly connected for a clinical reason, uh, but have of course security practices in place. Um, so all these uh, this uh, SMB issues that we're going to show you, you know, uh, we found them in less than an hour. We were actually searching for medical devices, um, and it just kind of came across it. So it wasn't a lot of research. I mean, the back end work that went into it, you know, that takes some time to understand that. But actually finding these and showed in, it was within within a half hour probably. And healthcare being, you know, ten years behind, it, I think it's pretty pretty easy to say that. I think, you know, when we when we talk to even, you know, I say 13, I mean, they'll say 10, and they'll even push it to like 15 years behind what they're seeing, you know, in other industries. So uh, it's not crazy. It's stuff that a lot of you in the room, um, if you went and worked for a medical device manufacturer and with your AppSec background, you probably helped them out a lot because it's stuff that you've already solved elsewhere. So good news, I guess, is, is kind of, you know, they can also, these issues can also be, uh, you know, fixed fairly quickly, or at least identified fairly quickly. So this is how we first came across that after we started, we were using Shodan, and then uh, I was talking here just before, um, just before the talk here, and, and we did work with John. We did some, you know, custom queries, some custom ports that would identify the medical devices. Uh, some of those ports have been made public, others have not. So some stuff like X11, that's now been made public. That was uh, one of the, the searches that we did. We actually brought in the, the entire <laughs> Uh, Chinese uh, research network and healthcare organization wide open. We reported it to them and they said, oh, that's just the cost of a research institute. So, okay, we reported to them. But uh, we were doing a search, and like I said, we were looking for medical devices. We weren't necessarily looking for what we stumbled across. And so I did a search for anesthesia. And I quickly realized that other than it being an XP box, there was no indication that it was really a medical device or a supporting system. And so when I opened that up, I realized that SMB was open. So SMB was open and was leaking intelligence on all of their internal network systems, including medical devices. And when I speak about medical devices, I think I, you want to be careful to kind of identify what I mean. Um, so a lot of folks, if you think medical device, you'll think maybe just the infusion pump itself, right? Or any vulnerabilities inside the infusion pump. But it's really an ecosystem, like I said. These things are networks. So infusion pumps, almost always on wireless, almost all of the time. And the reason is they talk to a centralized server that holds and pushes out things like drug libraries down to the system. Uh, so th th they're always on the network. So you can find you know, other flaws in, in, in those types of systems, things like that. So when I say medical device, I don't just necessarily mean the medical device, but it could be one of those other systems or servers that has a vulnerability that can directly interact and push instruction set through an application, through you know, a web service, thing like that. So there's, there's a lot of that going on um, that affects the medical device operation that isn't necessarily a vulnerability directly inside the medical device. So the first healthcare organization we found was, was big. Um, it took, I worked with uh, Sean Mergering here on this, um, and, and it took hours just to download like the export dump from, from Shodan. So 
There's over 68,000 systems that they had on their internal network. Now that's all, that's all their systems. That wasn't just medical devices. We were looking at it for medical device side, but they also had their financial systems, everything, domain controllers. We, had, we were able to identify it all and hit all of it from, from the internet. They had over 12,000 employees and 3,000 physicians. And you'll see when we get into some of the examples that I, when I actually show you some of the, the data and the screenshots from here, that they, they did have a large cardiovascular and neuroscience center, so that's why you'll see kind of a high number of you know, MRI systems or you know, pacemaker systems, those types of things. And lastly, one of the interesting things that we found was that it didn't only you know, compromise or open up that organization, there was very good indicators that third-party organizations also had systems that were vulnerable. So no one companies that provide, for example, lab service to healthcare organizations or third-party radiology reads, those types of companies were clearly systems that were inside of here. So because I know that, you know, I'm fairly confident um, I didn't take it down to that level of the, the third party we were reporting it, but I didn't talk to any third parties, but there were definitely uh, because of that name correlation, uh, they're commonly known in the industry, uh, their third party organizations are also available. So did we only find one healthcare organization? We did. So here's some of the, the search examples um, that we ran. They're kind of scrubbed out, but if you know, showed in, that's very simple. Um, basically what we did is we ended up switching it out, so we ran an SMB search with you know either health clinic, hospital, I think the health one is in there now. Um, and you can actually see it, that one's archived. The clinic hospital did some other things with medical, and that's the number of hits that we got uh, for those organizations that had uh, SMB open and was leaking uh, system information from their internal systems. Once you change that to more uh, specific identifiers, so things like uh, specialty clinics, so like uh, podiatry or pediatric or uh, urology, those types of things, it quickly it, it got up into the thousands. Definitely quite a few uh, healthcare organizations and, and providers that were had this open. These are just some, some quick key maps here. That's your clinic, the hospital. And I'm sure uh, there's some things we can change uh, that would, that would uh, close that, uh, that, that, uh, that language gap. Um, that's probably why we see such a centralization inside of the US and, and not necessarily in other countries. So who cares? The like, well, big deal you found SMB, you know, open on some external system for these healthcare organizations. Well, not only that, it was as I said before, the only indicator that it could have been a medical device was that it was on Windows XP and it wasn't patched for MSO 067. So does everyone know what MSO 067 is? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> some folks I asked that and, and uh, they don't have any idea what it is, even the security. And then DerbyCon asked it, and like only like 25% remember what that was for some reason. But anyways, it, it was XP, it was Service Pack 2, so it was directly uh, vulnerable to direct attack. So that is important to understand, uh, but it obviously had ports open uh, through the firewall to the internal system to get this. So we're going to get into some of the screenshots here, what we found, but really the information that it does expose through here is, is very detailed. It tells us exactly what type of systems they are, uh, what they're associated with. It gives us the host names of every one of those devices, and it also is going to leak floor, office, position name you'll see in here. You'll also see systems that have timeout exemption set by Active Directory policy. So you'll see system timeout set to zero, indicating that, that they have an exemption uh, from the policy. So here we go. So here's some of these. Over on the left, um, this one is just the lockout exemption. You can see the screen, screen lock zero exemption. Uh, in each of these examples, the far left column is scrub but that's the actual host name of their system on the internal network. And then you see the indicator of what type of device it is. Uh, over here on the right, is anyone familiar with Epic? Yes. Yeah, so Epic's uh, a very large provider of uh, medical records. And, and I want to make it clear too that uh, even though Epic's in this example or some other vendors may be in this example, this isn't like a vendor problem, right? This is a misconfiguration. So, they could have made the most secure product and then the healthcare organization screwed it up and didn't implement it securely. Um, now, the ironic part is that in this case, uh, I worked with, with that organization uh, after we reported it. Uh, but the irony in all of this is that that XP system also happened to be 
a server that was running a medical device it was put in by a medical device manufacturer that exposed their organization, so not good. <laughs> but here we go, Epic, just uh, for those not kind of familiar or not familiar with Epic and EMR, some of these servers up here, so like down here at the bottom, my chart, that's basically the patient portal. So it's a patient portal, a mobile app. That's how you get access to their medical record over the web. Um, hyperspace is the actual application. Uh, some things you could go after as an attacker, uh, where the databases are going to reside, is going to be like in the business objects, in the Clarity database. Um, and business object, that's, that's the, the time for all of their reporting and all of their data warehouse. So we now know exactly what systems are going to control that. And this isn't necessarily you know, patient safety per se, it's still more privacy, but it's still a big deal. It's a lot of information for an attacker, also knowing that from the outside it's XP systems that are vulnerable, and then you can pivot it to the inside. All right, so here's some more devices. So up here we have examples of uh, radiology stuff. So the top ones, uh, you can see is Paxure radiology. Pax, that's just imaging, that's all that is. Um, that's not the actual CT scanner. These other two, the MRI system and the CT scanner inside the network. Telemetry, it's a little bit different. There's a couple things that run on there. I got infant abduction systems. It doesn't need to be there. Uh, it's not the only thing that runs on, on telemetry. Uh, you also have you know, similar stuff, infant abduction, it's like wandering patients. Uh, actually, uh, pacemakers and, and programmers actually use telemetry in around under 400K and, and for close proximity to, to reprogram and you know, like test shocks or rescue shocks to an implantable defib. They also run on top of uh, telemetry. Cardiology systems. So this one is uh, interesting. You can see here in the first couple of examples, it's doctor so-and-so. So in, in, in a lot of these cases, uh, if you're, you know, you've got the, the doctor's name, you know the office location, you know the floor, you know the devices you know, that they're associated with, you know if they have lockout exemption. So it's, it's a lot of information here. The bottom one, this pacemaker, I, I scrubbed out the rest of it, but that was actually one of the pacemaker controller systems that's used to program um, you know, the refrigerators inside the organization. And then this is a pediatrics nuclear medicine here in the middle. And down on the bottom, these are some examples of uh, anesthesia. Some of these are different, like anesthesia workroom, you know, you can interpret that one. That's probably like somewhere in the anesthesiology department. That's probably not an actual workstation that's hooked up to an anesthesia cart. But the anesthesia OR one for sure is. Um, and if you know anything about the OR, like space is very limited. And so those carts have an onboard workstation. Uh, so they're not going to have inside of the OR another you know, system for anesthesiology. The only thing that they're going to have in there is that, is that cart just for space reasons. So. And there was interesting, I had, uh, when I first did uh, research, and an article came out on the wire April or May last year uh, on, on the findings. There was one of the things that I had said is, you know, was there any you know devices that really kind of had good security controls uh, in place? And, and I think my comment was anesthesiology carts and ventilators have historically not been networked, and so the security is pretty solid, especially you know, from a network perspective, not to get locally. The day after the article went out, another com article comes out in Ars Technica, and some physician decided to take their iPhone, and they needed to charge it, and they plugged it into the anesthesia card and started, like, dumping the drug. So, <laughs> so they took this, and they did all the analysis, like, on this anesthesia card, and it had to be, I mean, this was something, like, you know, you, you couldn't prevent. It had to be a specific iPhone model, a specific version of iOS. If they plugged in, you know, Android phones, anything like that, it didn't affect it. Other, you know, iPhone devices, iOS levels, didn't affect it. They plugged this one in, and it just dumped it. And you just wanted this phone charge. But luckily, I mean, the patient wasn't, like, hooked up, and you know, nobody died. Um, <laughs> so that's a good part of the story. But, you know, kind of those unintended things. This is... This is one of the more, uh, you're not going to prevent it uh, stories, but most of these things are just absolutely terrible. So we found a few devices, well we didn't. We didn't just find one organization, we found thousands. We didn't just find one device, we found hundreds. So here's kind of an over, uh, overview of just the main organization out of thousands that we actually took the time to do full data analysis by dumping it into our favorite data analysis tool called Excel and doing searches for various keywords on their systems. PACS? So PACS, it's PAC system. So PAC system is used for 
Um, this is, that's, that wouldn't be like a patient safety issue. Uh, that would be more patient privacy. So PAC systems are where uh, any of your radiology equipment that, that you see inside of the healthcare facilities, so your MI, your CTs, your nuke imaging, that's where all your images are stored is in the back end PAC system. So there's a treasure trove of patient information there. Uh, when I did my research on actual PAC systems, all but one vendor, through the application, you had to log in, and it required login through the application, unique IDs, everything like that. But they made a hard-coded web service call to the back-end storage to retrieve that. So if you went directly at the network level and just went to the IP, it didn't have any like NTFS security permissions. It's wide open and the hard-coded password and username was found in the user manual and all but one case could be used as well to grab all of that information. So I think this is something that we've clearly discovered there's lots of them out there on the internet, even if you do PAX searches through Shodan right now and just search for PAX, you'll find some of them. That in order for like medical identity theft, the way this stuff's getting out. Um, because they're very poorly secured on the back end file storage and it has all of your PHIs in it. <coughs> so what types of attacks do we look at, right? Physical is probably, you know, most risk. Um, but in this case, but I think it's valid. You get a lot of information out of there, it shows you you've got that physician name, you've got the office location, the floor number, you know if a system has a time on exemption. So you could look at that and you can say as an attacker, okay, I know that I can go to this office, this floor, it's this doctor that's this type of physician. Sit down at their system, it doesn't have a lockout exemption, I'm probably going to be able to sit right down and get on. I'm not going to have to log in. So it's not set the time out. Secondly is phishing. Uh, phishing is really, uh, you know, the other type of attack, obviously, you know, once you deliver that payload, now that you know those direct host names, as an attacker, it's very easy to write a custom payload to just go after. I just want to go after the Epic servers and try starting defaults, you know, on database uh, level stuff in order to, to get patient information. Or I just want to go after a few Pivot. This is the easiest one um, in this scenario. Uh, with the pivot attack, because that XP system was vulnerable uh, to MS08067, and we know it allowed communication, because SMB was the vulnerability and SMB is the default you know, protocol uh, for MS08067, you can pivot directly into any of these devices because it was their network was misconfigured. And you can also, um, uh, when you got in there, like I said, you could go after some of those third-party systems too. There definitely wasn't segmentation uh, between those internal groups. So, so do, do they only care about financial gain? I, th I think that's some of it. Uh, we are seeing uh, the community health systems, like is anyone, everyone familiar with that? Some of you know about community health systems. So CHS was a big breach this year in healthcare. And the headlines that it got were around patient privacy, right? So. The headlines were four and a half million patient records were, you know, stolen by the attacker. But when I got the information, when I got the, the uh, FBI, the, the PIN and private industry notice, what stood out to me was this the first time that the federal agency has actually put it in writing. And inside of there, outside of the, the headliner, four and a half million patient records, it also said the attackers uh, specifically target medical devices. So what are they doing? Uh, it, it probably, because a lot of the other stuff they're doing is for financial gain, it probably was for you know, IP rights, trying to uh, figure out how to you know, knock off their competitors. There's a big push if you understand MedTech in China. China right now um, doesn't, uh, it, they use a lot of uh, outsourced uh, MedTech companies. So they don't have a lot of in-country, other than some of the upcoming like mobile and digital health stuff. Do you have a question really quick? Really quick, the reason why medical records are targeted is because apparently they're worth much, much more for insurance fraud. Yes, than regular. Medical. Absolutely. Yep. So they are they are worth more for uh, the insurance fraud, um, and uh, there's some stuff in here too. When you get into the medical record from the patient safety side, the same weaknesses that they use. Um, so there's medical identity theft. There's a lot of good research around. Uh, what's been done in the results from, you know, incorrect data as a result of identity theft uh, for misdiagnosis, mistreatment, you know, being prescribed the wrong medication, those types of things. So that's something on like data integrity that we look at that 
it's not just the patient privacy issue, it's also a patient safety issue. Because some of these devices we can completely alter and we completely dump, like forge uh, records down from the devices into the patient's medical record. <clears throat> so the other thing is, you know, they're not technically adaptable adversaries. Uh, th I mean, this is, this is simple stuff. Like, this is not advanced. This show hand queries that we looked at. Publicly disclosed vulnerabilities from 2008. Uh, you know, open source reconnaissance. So, you know, terrorist extremists, I mean, I suppose, you know, you'd be someone that could look at the, you know, an attack vector. Um, nation state uh, you could do a lot of things. Dave Kennedy, you know Dave Kennedy, your relic? Yeah, but if you, you're not sure. Um, he actually did a, is this cool, like, POC device that they went into a healthcare organization and it's like this little EMP and you plug it into the wall outlet and the thing would bring down like the whole operating room and just would go dark. It was, it, it was nuts. Um, all the city and stuff that he did back in the day. But <clears throat> Nation state stuff, you know, that's something we can look at. Patients themselves, this is a really cool story. Um, it's, it's something that, that I didn't come across that, that Sean Erdinger did, but I hadn't even thought of it. You know, I'd always looked at who's the adversary and since I'm a security guy, I'm always thinking like hackers, bad guys, those types of things. Well, this story was actually from a patient himself. And so, Linz Hospital is in Austria. And in 2012, like, two patients presented, and they had gunshot wounds and fragmentation wounds. Now, I was really pissed off that the article didn't tell me how these people got gunshot wounds and fragmentation wounds. But what they did tell us is that after those patients presented, uh, they felt that they weren't getting enough medication. So they hooked them up to a morphine chip. And they hooked them up to what's called a PCA module which is basically patient control administration is what that stands for. So that's when you have that little clicker and you have like an upper and lower threshold. Um, but you can, can, can control that administration. And so these patients uh, kept telling the clinicians that they weren't getting enough of the drug and, and their pain management wasn't going well. Well, they decided that they were going to go online and pull up documentation. They found hard-coded credentials inside of the service technician manuals and they dialed up the drug. And over the course of two days, they developed tolerance and ODs like symptoms to the drugs themselves. So patients are kind of a you know something that I didn't think about, and then I was like, wow, you know what? Patients can also harm themselves. And they, you know, they they're an adversary in a way. And not a traditional one think it was an attacker, but you know, something like that they can cause harm to themselves. So what's the greatest risk? I mean, reality is probably right now is probably a combined attack, and not even necessarily just the medical devices. I mean, it would be something, you know. <clears throat> You know, taking down the ICS infrastructure in a hospital, or taking down, uh, you, you know, that, that HVAC like component to like an OR. I mean, OR and, and, and heat control is very critical to like infection, infection prevention. So if those interchanges start pulling air from outside, um, OR becomes a dirty and not a sterile place, can cause a lot of uh, uh, infection. Um, but you know, something you know in conjunction with like the Boston Marathon bombing, those types of things. Is anyone familiar with Cyber City or what they're doing? So CyberCity is really looking at uh, critical infrastructure, and so they have it set up uh, for, uh, you know, they have, they have basically everything. They've got uh, power plants, you know, ICS infrastructure, they've got healthcare infrastructure, they've got transportation, the train set up, and then they train people to, you know, attack those and then they'll detect those. But what I had said, um, actually, in an article maybe a few months ago, uh, and, and then I talked to him and he said, we actually, for Cyber City, we had to implement additional security because the realistic environment was just too easy to get into. So that goes to show again that you know we're kind of you know, 10 to 15 years behind. It was the only environment that they hardened just because it was too easy to break into if it was in a realistic state. So obviously, you know how how, how do these groups you know kind of fix that? I mean, it's really. In, in the SMB stuff, uh, I'm going to get into a, a use case here, but the SMB stuff is really uh, attack surface reduction, you know, everything you guys are familiar with showing at, um, you know, scanning external networks. <laughs> this guy was awesome. So I, I recently moved, uh, about three months ago, but I did live in Minnesota, so I did not just like Google this image. This is a real image. I was driving to work one morning uh, in Minnesota, and, and I was stopped, and I looked over at the bar, and this guy was sitting at the bar with his infusion pump. And I said, man, I don't know if that guy's you know, smart or stupid, 
Um, I said, you know, he's smart because uh, he, she's probably not hooked up to the, the hospital's Wi-Fi anymore, so you couldn't get attacked. But if you look real close in his right hand, he's, you know, he, he's smoking, and he also had a bottle behind his leg. So maybe the smoking and the drinking were important. Because anyone hacks his inclusion on the plate. Yeah, he's your double take. Wait a minute, I'm going to drive around the, drive around the block and doing one of these under the arm as I drive by, he wasn't very happy. I had the so, so why are they, why is healthcare, you know, why is healthcare tenure not mine? Um, is it because they, you know, completely ignored it, they're all idiots that work there, including me? Uh, not really. I think the reason healthcare got budget was for HIPAA. It's still a main driver for budget, it's regulatory uh, requirements. And what that's created, I think, is, you know, compliance information assurance based. Uh, inside of healthcare, it's created that checkbox security mentality. Uh, it doesn't look at adversarial risk. Manufacturers are kind of in the same boat. They, they haven't historically looked at it. And you've got to understand, like in, in the medical device, so I say 10 years behind. But what if that's an implantable? So there's, uh, you know, new technology, especially if it's implantable, even on an expedited approval from the FDA. Uh, I'm trying to think of an example. So th there was an example of a, like, underarm uh, the defibrillator technology that, that just got released. And on expedited approval, approval it got approved at the end of 2013. Does anyone know when they actually started developing that? Take a guess, anybody. 2013. What? 2013? No, no. <laughs> 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 yeah, closer to 2000. So they started with their prototype development in 2001. So you have a 12 year development life cycle to market, and then you have to support the thing for another 15 years. So there is a challenge. It's not like they just completely ignored it, but it is a new threat too, right? Um, they haven't looked at that. They, they have done, has anyone heard of like the Therac 25? No? So the Therac 25 was actually back in 587. There was uh, linear accelerators. And in the linear accelerators, they had uh, hardware failures um, in place in the first two models. Well, in the third model, in the Therac 25, they decided, eh, we're just going to use software. We're not going to have hardware failures uh, when we're amping up. Uh, the radiation and ionizing it. Well, what happened is like, six people ended up with adverse patient safety events, three people died from um, radiation overdose, and they couldn't figure out what it was. And eventually, out of those three people that died, two of them happened to be at a facility in Texas and at the same facility. So they analyzed the device, did the forensics on it, and they realized that when they did like some codes, if you did the override for the code, once you did the override for the code, and then if you hit enter within eight seconds after you overrode the code, which the staff was familiar with because it happened so often and they would call support and support would just tell them to get this button to override it because we don't know what it means because our documentation doesn't tell us what it means. <laughs> so if you hit the override code and you hit enter, then it would shoot out like max radiation and the patient would say they would just start getting shot. So that was back in 85 and 87. So they've done good things on like software clubs, which is having focus you know, on security. That's the other thing. You've been told they can't patch. FDA has come out since 2005. You can't patch uh, the rights of the cybersecurity security clause in there. I've uh, been told you can't change this hard coded you know, admin accounts. There's a lot of hard coded admin accounts, especially on legacy devices. It's one of the biggest problems, one of the biggest things we find. Um, I'll kind of show you, you know, uh, in this deeper case, kind of, you know, what we do for research side what we find. Uh, information security and biomed teams, they historically haven't talked to each other. You've had the biomedical equipment, and then all of a sudden network interface cards and Bluetooth and Wi-Fi has been put in, and they've stayed with biomed. They have you know, started talking with information security. So this is a case study. I'll uh, talk about this a little bit before we get into it. This is with defibrillators. <clears throat> so this device, this is just an example kind of the threat modeling as a researcher in our, or as an attacker, you know, how do you go about the, you know, looking at the medical device, security vulnerabilities, flaws inside of any device. And, and this is specific, you know, some stuff we did on, on, on the defibrillator, but this is everything. This is how we do it as a researcher. We initially will spend a lot of time looking at documentation. So we'll scour the internet, Google, there's a couple other sites to get service technician manuals, right? understand the infrastructure, understand how all the components work. Then we'll actually have a plan of, okay, this is the attack surface, this is what we're going to go at. And by the time you're there, if you've done your research like ahead of time and looked at these devices, probably 80% of the time, if you think 
you've got an attack path that's valid based on this, you're going to get it. So this was a case on show end where we did it all the way through. So these is all X series. This is them showing up on the public internet, and you can see that they're on Verizon. When you go to those links, it actually comes up with a, with a web server interface. Well, they did make it so that you need a certificate to actually communicate with the web server. The problem is, when you go to the web server, the landing page, all of the root certificates are right there for you. So you download the web certificates, then you can connect. So it was also the first defibrillator um, to market that had integrated wireless and Bluetooth. And so there's some screen caps from their, their marketing about how it's the greatest on their website and their, their literature. And of course, that's by design. So understand there's a clinical reason why all of these you know, security flaws are there, or this attacks are just with all these wireless connectivity and cellular connectivity, and why would you want an external defibrillator to have you know, cellular connectivity? Well, these types of systems, and it's not just Zoll, um, because it's probably there's the others, they all they sit inside of a, in an ambulance and they have a 12 volt you know, lead to do, to do uh, readings. And the reason for the wireless uh, is for printing. To a printer, and the reason they've designed it with cellular is so that they can send that 12 uh, lead information to the receiving ED prior to their arrival. So there's a clinical reason why they did it, um, and of course that's why in the marketing material, you know, they're first to market with this. But obviously there's some unintended consequences, and when you have Bluetooth, uh, your wireless, and cellular, you should probably reduce your attack service and, and, and pick one of those technologies instead of. <laughs> Catching on and throwing everything. <coughs> All right. So once you get to the device, here's exactly, um, and this is done for the documentation. So let's just show you what we need to do. So XML. So XML. Um, if it's a Windows system, we search for XML files as soon as we get on the device. If it's a Linux-based system, we search for comp files, and then we just start looking through them and finding out what they do. It's a USB device. Yes. You this can put any of your cool microcode on it you want. Yeah, but you have to you have to name it the super secret name. It won't work. <laughs> yeah, I'll show you. Yeah, we can. The so in order to do the config through the documentation, it tells us exactly what we need to do through that service tech manual. Right, we just have to upload this file and do an import for sole config.xml. But we still don't know, you know, what type of parameters or anything like that. Well, luckily. The documentation tells you, um, one, they tell you different parameter settings, but if you look in the actual documentation, they'll specifically give you every parameter. So they'll tell you, in order to put it in pediatric mode or adult mode, this is the value you put in this line of the XML config file. And so they tell you line by line in that XML file in the documentation what to do. So you can change that device from being in um, you know, pediatric mode to being in adult mode, and if it was something that was used in a pediatric scenario and they weren't paying attention, I mean, that's going to change that initial, like, shock, that joule voltage from, like, 10 joules to, like, 50 or 60. You know, you potentially kill uh, an infant. So you do have to get to the supervisor menu in these systems in order to do that XML. And this is kind of how you do that. And luckily, they put a four-digit supervisor passcode before you can get in and you can upload that. Well, there's the code. One, two, three, four. Ships are on the On top of it, after you've done that, you know, if you're an attacker, you might want to clear your logs. Well, in order to clear logs by default, you can see all it requires is when it pops up and it says, do you want to clear the logs? Absolutely. You can enter and it just clears them. Um, or you can be super secure, you can switch to numeric, and then it goes back to one, two, three, four. Here's the rest of the problem. So these are default and hard-coded uh, credentials for pretty much all of their latest uh, external defibrillator monitors. What's that? Repudiation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So here's the CVEs that were released. Um, those top two are what I just showed you. This bottom one was done uh, by Billy Rios. Uh, I've actually worked with these devices as well. Uh, Pixis Supply Station. This is something that uh, at a nursing station, this is used for medication dispensing. Uh, so they also they have bigger units, Pixis uh, does and the others, that are like those robot arms that you see at the pharmacies. And those also have vulnerabilities. I know hospitals 
um, that, that I've spoken with, uh, they actually, these, these big supply stations, they, they're running on XP2, uh, and they're infected like every week, and the manufacturer just ships them into the image hard drive through the place every week. That's their solution. Yeah. Did you disclose the, um, the issues of the Zola X series back at DEF CON? Did they ever actually reply to you? They haven't. Well, I, I should say, yes, they, they did call. Um, and so it took months, like during the disclosure, they, they never responded. Um, we just wasn't to get just never responded, never heard back. Uh, and then probably within a couple of weeks after we dropped them at DEF CON, um, you know, because at that point they were oh, yes, they didn't want to respond. Um, they did call. Um, you know, and, and it was uh, another smaller organization that was very, you know, the person said they were a security individual, but they were really their director of product development. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's, it's not uncommon. I mean, if it's, this is new to all of them. Uh, so, you know, the larger organizations that have more devices, they're, they're going to have already worked through this a couple of years ago. Uh, but some of those you know, smaller manufacturers that are more segmented, they haven't had that. They haven't had a security researcher say, hey, we've got a device. Or they haven't been on the receiving end of DHS or ICS search calling them and saying, hey, some crazy researcher found a vulnerability in your device and we want to talk to you about it. They shut down. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think they've been resolved. I have no indication that they have been. Um, documentation that's still on their website hasn't been updated and it still has it. So, the supply station vulnerabilities were in there. Those were, you know, hard-coded passwords inside of the, the database. They also um, run remote services that have used the same credentials as, like, the SA accounts for the database. So you can remote into these systems, and myself and Billy have both found ways where you can completely, like, dump out all the controlled meds out of these systems, and put it into, like, an override offline mode, like an emergency mode, and once you throw it in there, you can completely dump uh, like all, all the medication out of these devices, and then luckily they also have a clear event log that you can go into by design. So you go in like eight folders deep, and there's clear events.exe, and you run that, and then completely wipes like every trace that you've been into the system, other than obviously if you're doing something at the network level or something like that, but very unlikely. I mean, you pointed out an interesting point on, on these vulnerabilities. Spinning it the other way, um, you know, you look at some of the recent European uh, legislation, keep treating software as a medical device, the FDA has got has some things up. Do you think that's a necessity to change the behavior moving forward? Or is, are there industry groups that are hopefully will take up the slack without that level of government oversight? So, there we go. We'll put it on my slide and we'll talk about it. Like, thanks. Yeah. I see the question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so the, the FDA's involvement, other industry working groups, right? They've taken a hands-off approach. I think one, they would like industry to solve it. Two, currently, quite frankly, they don't have the resources to assess security controls um, at that level. Uh, and there's many factors. I mean, there's, there's tight turnaround on 510K submissions, which is what's required for a device prior to uh, getting pre-market approval. Um, and going to market, and they only have 90 days to, to turn that around currently. I think the driving force um, where there's really going to be leverage is, and you know, there's there's quite a few, uh, Mayo is an example, um, they've came out many times now and said that they're working on it, is, is during that, that, that procurement process for the healthcare organization, writing in kind of, you know, best practices during procurement and what can you do from a buyer perspective before you purchase the product to push back on the manufacturer. Um, so that for the manufacturer, it then becomes a, a requirement. Really, that's, that's changing the industry. The FDA could come out tomorrow. I mean, if an event happened that was bad enough, I mean, there would be regulation tomorrow and then everything would be getting tested. Be getting tested improperly, probably, but it would be getting tested. Um, and so I think it's kind of a, a balance, right? I think there needs to be some guidance, and that's kind of, they have been loose, loose about their their guidance, both for industry that came out you know, years ago, and then the pre-market submission is something that came out in, in October. So there was uh, some recent progress. Uh, the FDA held a medical device security workshop as well in October. This is the first time that everybody kind of got together and they released their guidance and really started 
you know, talking. We've been, you know, always talking like in little silos, but this was the first time, that, you know, a regulatory body had kind of gotten everyone together in the same room to, to look at medical devices. And there was also, recently after that, in November, uh, there was another uh, initiative on IEEE, um, and this would be more AFSEC related, a good thing to look at. Uh, is we all went down to New Orleans and it was IEEE and SF and uh, George Washington and Cybersecurity Initiative put this on. And it was really a building code concept for uh, you know security you know by design at the end of the phase. And so if you look at this it's a really good framework. Um, it provides guidance to manufacturers to look for as you know supplements with the FDA guidance um, to kind of get on track. There's nothing you know riveting and new about any of these. It's just, you know, it's really, hey, get a bunch of, you know, engineers and asset people in the room, and what did you do 10 years ago? All right, let's put it in a paper and put it out, because um, that's really what's there. But uh, you go to the site, um, you know, Building Code for Secure Medical Devices, it's just a Google site right now, but they just released the, the draft report to kind of take a look at, at some of that. Any other questions? <coughs> yes. Oh, with the I know they're sitting there, you know, probably building some of my own. There's thousands, it seems like, Bluetooth LE devices now used in exercise, workouts, you know, or presumably also in the health medical. Yep. What's the impact on this standard? Well, the standard's been around for a while, but the impact for this massive influx of yeah. craziness. So there is. It's like this right here is actually, um, this is still a, a prototype that they have a model on the market, but this is an actual, like, full. ECG here, sent it to a cardiologist that can pump it down to my physician and I'll read it anytime I want to. Because mobile and digital health is huge and it's expanding. Um, and there's all kinds of these you know, types of devices that are then wanting to interact you know, with that medical record. And so there's there's other uh, you know, products out there, uh, there's a few companies that are kind of doing like a, a, a band for like infants, and so it's like an infant like soccer band that does like vital monitors and presents it through you know, the iPhone app then it's accessible over the internet so you can check on it. And then there's even um, this ingestible, it's a bionic like pancreas, like artificial pancreas, where it's an ingestible, and then you ingest it, and it monitors your glucose, and it's hooked up to your insulin pump. And every five minutes, it calls back over Bluetooth and, and, and uh, reads you know, your glucose and your blood levels, and then automatically reconfigures the pump over wireless the levels back. And so that's some of the new technologies. It's great for, you know, great for a patient care you know, perspective. But some of the unintended consequences here, you know, if they're not building security, that's some kind of scary stuff. Yeah, and there's probably some lines of uh, some of the worst code written on the planet. Yeah. 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 That process is good. Yeah. 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 So there's a lot of them. Um, the other thing is from the FDA standpoint for the medical, uh, for the mobile and the digital health is their stance has been, you know, Apple went in had a big meeting, put a lot of pushback on their eye health kit, and then it comes out, well, we're not going to necessarily regulate these, we don't want to stifle innovation in the mobile and digital health. Well, we couldn't secure, you know, $10 million plus CT systems, why the hell are we going to be able to secure a you know, $50, you know, attachment to your device that's not filtering, you know, <coughs> the of course, code for iOS is not open, so. Well, no, but it's not just the application whatsoever. There's a lot of Android apps, too, so. Well, Android apps, you can look at the code. Yeah. And you can do some verification. You have a whole of verification. But a lot of it's done over there. Uh, unencrypted, <laughs> just over 480, and it's pumping data down. Or oh, yeah, using, using yeah. someone's kit that there's no on the internet. <clears throat> so you, can, you can man in the middle of it, and then once you get all of, of the parameters, like out of birth, you can just force data down into the medical record. Once you know the UIDs for the actual patient record and those types of things, that's easy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, two things. It's easy to reverse engineer on Apple and I'm not going to get into that. Yeah. And <laughs> the second thing is, have you done any work on the Vegas Nerve Stimulator? I have not. Okay. Uh, and also, you said that you talked about the worst risks about getting data. Isn't, couldn't they use some of that data for biohacking as well if they wanted to target individuals? I mean, you could. You get, could get specific, you know, information. But I mean, that would be, you know, that'd be on the medical information side. I mean, really, it would just be where you're extracting all the medical records, kind of using it for, like you said, like background information. If you wanted to do a targeted attack, if you, you 
with some high profile individual or something like that. Yeah, but couldn't you fake information in someone's record so that they are then reasonably dosed with something that would kill them? What do you, what do you mean by fake? Putting something in their record doesn't give someone a drug. Well, yeah, but then they use that for... Now, they do use it, like a medical identity, like someone shows up, like I show up as you, and then I need my you know, morphine, and then or, you know, my Percocet, and then I get my Percocet, and then you come back and you ask for a pain med, and you're actually allergic to it, but they say they prescribed it a month ago and they give it to you, that type of thing happens. Yeah. And yeah, misprescribing, and that's the data integrity issue, and that's the bigger issue with the mobile and the digital health. When you look at the actual data, it's like non encrypted web services and sitting in between. And once you fill, you know, you, you figure out all those parameters and you just post stuff to the actual web service, don't have the medical record. Because all of these devices inside, <coughs> even, not necessarily just external, but even the anesthesia costs now, the ventilators. The ventilators are critical when it comes to population health management because what happens is we've got this guy that, oh, you no, know, it's died from pneumonia. From the thing. So they want to figure out what is the root cause of it. Well, how do we do that? We get big data. How do we get big data? We plug that serial device for an Ethernet adapter, use a proprietary protocol, dump it into the medical record now. It's not on the network and you can interface with it. Well, I'm going to add a little bit more correct. The two which can be dangerous if somebody does falsify your record. I was in the hospital in November. They went and downloaded my um, prescription stuff on mm -hmm. out by the right aid, and they saw I was taking some using some creams and stuff at home, and they show up with cream offering to give to them. No, no, I don't pay for that. You give me when I get home. But imagine if it's some other med, if somebody drops in like that, maybe somebody drops in the records, you have you take insulin. Yep. And, and they'll just show up, and, and they show up at 12 o'clock in the morning when I'm passed out, and give me insulin, and, and I'm not a diabetic. And so there was, like, um, not, not to that, but to infusion pumps. Uh, I'm pleading the fifth, but I don't know what's uh, in the article. Um, but the article came out um, from Jim Finkel, out of writers, and that, that Billy had done some research on a spear pump that, that uh, you know, he could go in and they had hard coded password for remote administration and could push uh, forged drug libraries down to the infusion pump. Um, so I can tell you, looking through documentation um, and from experience, those systems, those centralized monitors, former infusion pumps control the drug libraries, but there isn't like you know whitelisting. There's no like signed code or anything for those updates. There's not even network level controls that say this is a trusted source. So if you know how to forge the actual drug library, you can push and it will accept it. You touched on something about FDA regulation about not being an update or, or patch devices. Yep. Is that any software updates or because I want to? So it's for. Uh, so, so there's it, it, it's it, it's it's a little bit confusing, and that historically has kind of caused some issues, and why this has continued so long. Where oh, we can't apply, you know, patch for MSO 067 or something. But initially, it was significant software updates, and and now it's more if it is changes to the actual design of the device, then they need to go back for 510k reapproval. But there is a you know cybersecurity clause that says software updates and. Um, you know, patches as it relates to, you know, reducing vulnerabilities and security controls, so you can push it. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that you, then it comes back to liability, too. It goes back to a liability discussion, and, and one of the reasons of still do we patch or do we not is, so that says, tells the manufacturers that they can do it, and that's not legit. But what happens if you do it at a hospital, and then a patient dies because it hasn't been tested, who's liable? Is it yours to manufacture? So what's happening? Uh, some of the more progressive, you know, groups that have been working on this, like Phillips and the GEs, um, they take the approach of, you know, they'll test it within X amount of days, and then they'll put it up to their website and say, hey, this has been tested, this has been validated, and then tell the healthcare organization, you know, these are the ones that are that are approved and have been tested. Because one of the neuroscriminators I've been working on, one of them I saw the biggest release that actually says it's. It's updatable to new technology. I was surprised because I thought, oh, you just opened the front door before, like now you can push updates to it. So that's that's another thing. Is 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 there are a few of those those manufacturers that said, oh, this would be great since we're like we can just control it from centralized uh, patch management for every single, for instance, if you know that we own. Um, and it sounds great to them until so you want to actually talk to them and say, so what if I got into this? Server that I know you have you know, common password.
passwords for 15,000 people that access the thing to get into um, it has to be a common shared password. So, you know, those types of things, that, that, you know, there's, there's always the uh, intended use, and then the clinical setting is different, and then they can defibrillate it. Right? Even uh, if you want the, you know, the physician to forget the password or want two factor authentication to give you a, a shock to the defib, um, probably not. We're just going to do that right now. But, uh, it's, it's definitely a weight and balance and, you know, intending clinical use versus unintended, you know, security consequences from not embedding security by design. And there's a lot that can be done uh, without affecting, you know, clinical quality and care. Yeah. Scott, you mentioned, um, you know, the FDA is putting out additional guidance. Um, High Trust is spinning up a working group they just announced like last yeah. week or the week before. IEEE, are there any other pan-industry groups that you think generating guidance that can be used for the manufacturers that you know, are using the new one. It's one of the problems right now um, is there hasn't really been a, a forefront leader. So there's like ISO 8001 and there's Amy um, that works on it. Uh, they're more open, security's part of it. They work on interoperability stuff too. And there's MDIS uh, group that, that's formed. And then you get UL even uh, recently, you know, starting to look into medical device security and you get the underwriter lab site. Uh, working on the building code stuff that kind of came out that some of those folks are working on. So there's a lot of them. And to the manufacturer, it's very confusing because they have to pick and choose because they don't know what's going to be the front line. So right now they kind of take that, that, that guidance from the FDA and they look at these others, but they don't have that. That's the one of the things without having regulation that is the So the industry is trying to solve it, but then there's 12 different groups that are putting up 12 different components Pieces that you know, are security program. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, so I was going to ask about that FDA regulation. And uh, there was recently, I think in Louisiana, there was a FDA meeting. Yeah, that's what I was just talking about. It wasn't an FDA meeting in Louisiana, it was in New Orleans. New Orleans. Um, yeah, we all got together. Um, and it was actually ran by uh, IEEE that developed a building code for security medical devices. And that was more of like asset funding than actually security development. Yeah, the report all, just came out, um, it's got finalized maybe like three or four weeks ago. And is that addressing application security, yeah. software security, and other facets of network security? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not like a lot of network security. So it was really, it's building code yeah. Yeah. for the device. So like the network is like, okay, even if you develop this, like in these examples, the healthcare work is still implemented for you, right? So I think that would be something that you'd have to look at further. If that building code concept ever catches on, I mean, that's just how they related it to as a building code concept. But if you ever rolled something like that out, you then would have to have like an inspector regime to, to go and, you know, validate at the healthcare organization after it was implemented, that it was implemented properly as well to get to the, you know, the network you know, security. Yeah. So, but there's some guidance for industry that's been out since like 2000, at least 2010. Um, yeah. It's on like the healthcare provider side and the, the network side, but they're so compliance information assurance focused, they haven't really focused on, on that security aspect. Yeah. It seems like there's more focus now on the software and the application hardening and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Guys. To make one quick announcement. This group might be interested. Um, let's say the date June 4th.